box, so fine, I can find here everything. Uh, I get any answer back from Google why I think it's not the future. So the one answer is Google anyhow really become an all dominating empire. The problem with an all dominating empire is we don't know how it really works. We don't know what influence our search results. You enter a keyword into Google and you get sometimes a million search results back. So ask yourself what influence you have to the ranking of the search results Google gives you back. Can you trust any search result Google is giving you back? Do you know how Google obtained that research product? Is that really all what is available in the net? And already here the answer is no. <coughs> of course we get an answer to every question back from Google. But recently, Google has covered less than 50% of all the web pages available today. So, what we know from Google is just a little bit. We know why Google became famous. Google became famous because of an idea of the two founders page and print, which is a little formula giving every page in the web a ranking. So, if you assume the web, you can imagine the web to be in a big, big graph where the nodes are built by the different web pages and the nodes are connected at one page link on another website. So now you can ask the question when a website is very important in the web. So then one answer can be a web page is of course very important in case a lot of other web pages pointing on. So you see the problem you may have, it is very difficult for you to say how much other websites point to a given web page because you cannot see the incoming edges to your own web page. Because of Google know the whole web, they can tell you how much links there exist. And of course, then the second influence is uh, how important are the pages pointing to you itself. So if you have a point, a, a pointer, for instance, from your university administration to your homepage, from Telecom Malaysia to your homepage, from your government homepage, so that are probably for you the important links which are counting, while a link from myself or anybody in that room to a web page is not so important. So page and print came up uh, with a formula calculating their page rank by the probably probability that a visitor randomly directly enter the web page to a web browser or come to your web page from another web page which is pointing to your site and he not only summarize the number of those web pages but he summarize the importance of those web pages given by the page rank of that web page divided by the number of outgoing links because that is the probability that a random worker choose from that web page the link coming to the web page you are considering for calculating the page rank. So that is the formula what Page and Brin make famous. That is the basis of the success of Google because they can use that page rank to order the different web pages, the different uh, results given back to you in Google in case there are no commercial interests which may change that sequence of search results. So what else do we know about the web? What else we know about the web is mostly given to us by studies from science, scientists, so still the biggest one is that one from Broder and other scientists in the year 2000 considering the link topology, page similarities, user path flows on approximately 203 million web pages containing 1.5 million links. And they came up with a map of the World Wide Web consisting a strongly connected center part having the probabilities of a small world graph, uh, having two wings, a so-called in-wing, where you can move in the in-wing and come to the strongly connected center part, but not back to the in-wing, having an out-wing, 
which whose nodes you can reach from the strongly connected part going to the outwing, but you are never able to leave this outwing and come back to the strongly connected component. So there are a few tubes, a few tentacles, a few isolated components, that's approximately uh, how the web look like, uh, what is also known under the name the butterfly or bow tie graph of the web. Groups of other researchers came up with a question, what's about uh, laws in, user, uh, in web graph out and in degrees, about content distribution, about access to web pages. And they found for a lot of, uh, a lot of connections between information and the web that the power law uh, is, is here available. So what does it mean, the power law for the in and out degrees? If you look to that graphic, that is for the in and for the out degree, the presentation of the power law. That means you have here the two logarithmic uh, divided axis of the diagram. So you see here an almost linear function telling us there are a lot of web pages having a very low in degree. That means a very few other web pages pointing to it. There are very, very much web page, very, very, very few web pages only to which a lot of other web pages uh, are pointing to, and the relation in between here is a double logarithmic function or in a double logarithmic divided diagram, a linear function. So, what else we have, and here so far you will still have known about what I have told you. So the more I go on with my talk, the more you will realize uh, that these are results which you know less and less. So for instance, Newman and Moore and Watts uh, discovered more details on the small world model, like the property to find cluster in small world graph. That means uh, clusters are groups of nodes forming an almost complete subgraph in the web graph, uh, they define a cluster coefficient uh, and figured out the importance of the cluster and the cluster coefficient for other properties in the small world graph. In 1998, Gibson came uh, with an, with a, by, uh, Gibson differs the different nodes in the web graph. He said there are two classes of nodes in the web graph, the one class is built from the authority. That means web pages being a specialist in one topic, having a high authoritative uh, value uh, discussing exactly one topic. There are other pages uh, which contain a lot of pointers pointing to such authoritative pages. So for instance, the search engine Google is an example for that or just when you establish a page and collect the links to one topic, you also become a good hub for them. So that means we have hubs and authorities, and Gibson found out in 1998 uh, a possibility how to assign numerical values to hub and authority nodes, uh, telling, uh, telling us how much the property of being an authority or being an hub is developed for a given node uh, in the web graph. So, consequently, in 1999, John Kleinberg, till today another famous guy in the research of the net, developed the hypertext induced topic search using uh, that definition of hubs and authorities uh, as a basic for its algorithm. And I tell you that because we will later in the talk come back to the hits algorithm and the importance of hubs and authorities uh, in the web graph. So, the question is, if we don't want to use Google for search, if we don't want to use any of that algorithm which require a central database, a central knowledge uh, about the whole web graph, what are the alternatives, what else we can do? So, and why I criticize that so much, 
uh, that we need a central database for all of the other approaches I have discussed with you so far. The problem is, for all the approaches discussed, we need a classical search engine architecture. That means we need a crawler not doing nothing else than copying all the web pages to any big database. So you know, Google is not only one server, one farm of server. Google is a big, big uh, company employing as much computer that you need a whole power plant to feed them with electrical e uh, energy. So is it really worth to do so, to copy a whole internet? So do the, establish the internet a second time? I mean, besides the question, of course, uh, that uh, you may get from Google information you might not want to give to anybody else. So think about the last affair of the National Security Agency in the USA, which have caused at least in Germany a lot of uh, irritation and bad mood among uh, the people. So the question is, do we have any alternatives? Do we have any chance to find information in the web or in any similar architecture without having a centralized database and collecting the information from everywhere uh, frequently? What makes me, of course, a lot of problems too. Because of you can try by yourself, try to keep the information about hundreds of your friends updated every day. And you will see that it's a big work what you have to do, respectively in the network, a big amount of benefits which is allocated for those processes. So and if you are going into computer science, then the answer is of course, yes, we have alternatives. We know, for instance, since the year of 2000, file sharing systems like Nutella, which are used to copy music and are not very uh, very liked in the internet because they also cause a lot of traffic until today, but they employ a great mechanism to us. So what they are doing, they have a network like you have a network of friends, and if you are looking for anything, you go to one friend of you and ask the friend of you, do you have the information for me? And if that friend say, maybe I don't have it, that friend can at least ask all his friends. So, and the friends do the same again, and any when it happens that the information, in Nutella, the music file you are interested in, uh, is found. So, maybe not only with one friend, but with different friends. But then that friend can answer you, yes, I have the file, and it answer you, of course, over the friend, and the friend of the friend of you back in the same manner as us. And then you can use the normal hypertext transfer protocol and can choose the node which have a high bandwidth, uh, which offer the file in a good quality and download from that file the respective information. So there's one concept, you can find the information without having a central database, but you have to employ a flooding algorithm. For doing so, that means you generate quite much messages. So there was a guy and a lot of teachers in computer science which said we employ an exponential number of messages if we, can, if we assume for instance that every node in the Nutella community has four neighbors we get in the first step four messages when the friends ask their friends we get 16, 52 and so on unfortunately that's only on the first thought and Maybe that guy published that information because he was the head of the Napster company for some time. Let's count a little bit more, uh, more uh, what is really going on. So the first thing is, every message has a time to live. That means every search message in the Nutella network make only seven steps. Because it's a small world network, the diameter is quite small, namely, approximately 10 in the So if we would have a fully connected graph and every node keeps the message ID of the request but he has forwarded to another node at least for a small time interval and don't resend the same request a second time, then the information can be given from every node 
only once to all its neighbors. That means in the worst case, if the graph has n nodes, it can have an n to the power of two times if every of the node has every other node of the graph as a neighbor. But even that's not true. In a Windows network or in a Nutella network, there are only four open connections at every time, such that we don't get n to the power of two messages, but in the worst case, four times n messages, but it's quite less. So it's a quite less number of messages we are generated, and in fact, nobody really has seen that the Nutella network bro breaks down due to an overloaded network, and here's the reason why it's worked well. So, and when it's worked well, why we will not use it later for any other purposes. But before I come into that, a little bit more about alternatives. There is another almost forgotten network called Freenet. Freenet employs another quite interesting mechanism for search. It sends out only a single message for every search request to one neighbor node, which is sent back from dead ends and walk through the network until the respective information is found. If the respective information is found, sure it is given back in the same manner to the requesting node. And now happens something very interesting. Along that path, copies on all intermediate nodes are established. Not only copies are established on all intermediate nodes, also, the source of the information establish links to all intermediate nodes having a copy of the respective document. So, what happened by that? First, a document which is requested quite often will be found quite often in the network because a lot of copies are established. The network also evolves in a manner such that links between very active nodes are established with a high probability. So we have a network evolution depending on the use of information, depending uh, on the popularity of any information, what is another quite uh, interesting effect in a decentralized network. So and again, we are working and finding information without any centralized database. And if an information is quite often uh, requested, we have a lot of copies. So the probability that an information is found fast uh, is increased. So what we are doing in my department now, we exactly want to go on with that idea. We want to provide an information search in the World Wide Web without having any centralized instances available. So that means we have three possibilities uh, to approach it. We can either concentrate on the network and say we try to optimize the network structure. But how we can optimize the network structure without knowing what the users want to get from the network and without to analyze the content which is available. So it is clear for us that we want to do any optimization of computer network and we want to provide any cooperative search for information, we have to consider all those three aspects uh, in computer networks. So and our biggest part in the moment uh, is the user behavior, because in Germany it's quite difficult to collect information about user and to use information about user behavior for any analytics. So what we can do, that was the first question what we gave to us. And our approach is still, we say, 80% of all information in the World Wide Web is given in a textual form. So that means we have to concentrate on text mining, uh, either with a probabilistic or with a semantic approach. And the background for that is that usually only two to three keywords are given to Google, resulting in usually 10 to 100,000 answers of Google about that query. So that is a quite unsharp answer. We can sharpen it if we would have instead of two to three keywords, three to six keywords, because then the number of answers given back uh, is between 100 and 1,000. Still much, but definitely much less. 
because the experience is also from all the answers Google is given back to you. You mostly look on answers on the first three pages. That means only 30 of the results given back to you are really interesting. So the question is how we can find fastly additional keywords to provide the search of the user uh, without the user has to go into the documents, read the documents, find out what might be interesting for you. That is what you are usually doing when you are looking for state-of-the-art documents for your research. You get one document, go in, try to find out what are the characteristic words for that area, and then try uh, to uh, refine your search with them. Yeah, so here you have an example about what I said. Let's enter a popular word, Harry. Let's assume you are thinking about Harry Potter. So what Google is giving you back, 163 million different search results without any structure, without any independent ranking because you cannot influence Google's ranking, with no evaluation of trustworthiness, no support for you how you can refine that search, and no use of any of your evaluation that you can say, okay, that is a good result, that is a bad result. So that means you have even no possibility to feedback. So what is the reason for that? Google, of course, offer you to establish your own profile. But of course, Google is not able to collect too much information about you. Uh, and especially you don't want to give uh, too much context information from your search to Google because Google could find out quite fast what you are thinking about when you are doing so. So, what Google offer is just, it makes a statistics over the search requests, and then give you such input, such suggestions when you enter the Christmas tree, and Google knows there are a lot of answers available for the Christmas tree, and they tell you, do you need a shop, a stand, a farm, Christmas tree lights, or whatever, and you can choose from it. Uh, I figured out a little problem by that. Let's go on with a discussion on the Christmas tree. What is a Christmas tree? That is a Christmas tree. That is what in your mind now probably. That is a tree that you open and put in the living room uh, in December during the Christmas time. But also that is a Christmas tree. So what is it? What do you see here? This is a special valve which the engineers put on oil sources, so you Malaysians have oil, so you may know it. Mm -hmm. A special valve which is put on the oil sources, which has a lot of several uh, exits and look like a Christmas tree. So the engineers from the oil industry call that a Christmas tree too. Mm -hmm. So, in case you don't say, Google, I want to find a Christmas tree and say Christmas tree and oil, you have absolutely no chance to get that result. So, here we have a real problem now. Here we have now the problem we call word disambiguation. <laughs> so, a lot of words in the different languages are used in different contexts. So, here you have a few more uh, examples. For instance, the mouse can be an anime or a computer mouse. The Christmas tree we had, a cube can be the mathematical uh, body or can be a ugly car from Nizam. Harry can be Harry Potter, Harry Belafonte, and some others. So problem one we could try to solve. How we could help the user to solve the problem of word disambiguation. So that is a simple problem that we can uh, solve quite fast. We can solve quite fast if we don't give the information in advance to Google, but if we employ something like a local working agent, a local working agent which has access, for instance, to your mail files, to your other text files you are writing, to everything what you store on your computer, but firmly keep the information on your computer, just analyze it for its purpose, what the guy is doing, then when you come with your query, evaluating in which context you are actually working, you are actually doing something, 
looking for maybe additional words for the search from that information or from an interaction with you, giving the question to Google, receiving the research device from Google, eventually reorder the research device, and then give it back to you. So for the moment, for the last three years, that was our first approach for doing so. So when we got a few uh, nice results which I want to introduce to you before I tell you in the end uh, what we are doing now and where we are now. So, the second idea after the disambiguation with local context were pictures. So already in 1911, the expression use a picture and draws a thousand draws as we made from a journalist Arthur Brisbane. So you know it by yourself, when you see a picture, you get a lot, lot of contextual information out of the picture, out of the background of the picture, which are very hard to describe. You just see it in a tenth of a second and are able to tell which picture is interesting for the problem. So here's our solution, what, what we did, what you can download as an example point. You enter a search, not in a search engine like our hurry. And instead of giving you back 163 million results, our tool gives you back a set of pictures. So as you see, I enter Harry. You look on that picture. When you look for Harry Potter, you in advance come to that picture. When you look for Harry Belafonte, you come to another picture. So I can now take some text filing tools, analyze the web page which contains the image on which you click, or a set of images on what you click and suggest you further keywords for your search. When you click on that picture, definitely you can analyze from the frequency of words on that web page and what that would be a probably a good uh, second keyword uh, to support your search. So that is what we call PE search. Uh, it, it's a tool uh, you are available, you can obtain uh, from our uh, department to support your search. It's nothing else than a plug-in to your browser and when you call Google in the first stage you come up with a picture and you can then either make a second round with a picture if you click here the respective uh, buttons or you go on after selecting additional keywords uh, with a normal Google search. Yeah, so here it is, you click on that one Harry, uh, then you see and the tool analyze the web page, come up with Harry Potter, uh, book, film, review series, novel, cover, and you can choose what you are interested in, what are the additional keywords you may use to have five or six keywords uh, available. So that's the screenshot uh, here from our tool. So you see problem two, the most tedious and error prone task for you in the search process and looking for some very special information is find the right keyword, find the right keyword, letting Google you show exactly what you are interested uh, in. So that is very time consuming. So the question is, why not let the computer do the work for you? I had the dream I come in the morning to my office, I switch on my computer, and my computer to tell me, I know you are dealing with distributed simulations, here are 10 new publications I found in the last night for you. Why the computer shall be off and sleep in the night while it can do work for me? So it's exactly that is what we have realized in another tool called FX Researcher. FX Researcher support a directory I can put some files in I like to I like to read. Then in the night my computer is going looking for files that are similar to that files. So I'm using the source files I gave to the computer as a search request. The whole file, not the set of keyword, the whole file the computer can analyze. On the next day it brings 10 similar files to me. <coughs> And I can sort that 10 similar files to, to two directories. That one I like and that one I don't like. So don't forget every learning algorithm not only need a positive feedback, as you can give to the computer systems like Facebook or Google Plus, but every learning thing also needs a negative feedback. 
So why you don't have a dislike button in Facebook or minus one in Google Plus? Have you ever thought about that? It's another research work. What happens when you do that? Uh, which is done by one of my master students actually. So, and here we are exactly with that. So we support whole documents. We evaluate what is in the documents, find similar documents, and let the users uh, divide the found document in good and bad. So and in the next night, the game is repeated with the documents uh, you have there. So, then we did some more experiments. Uh, I introduced to you in the beginning uh, the Higgs algorithm. You remember, I thought there are nodes which are hubs, and there are nodes which are authorities. Authorities are related to a given topics. Hub is something like an upper instance distributing you to, to different subtopics. So now imagine you apply a so-called co-occurrence analysis to your text documents. You draw a graph. The node of the graph are the words which are in the documents. And you connect two nodes always when the, two, when the two words appear in one and the same sentence. So that is what we call a co-occurrence in, in text writing. The appearance of two words in one sentence. So then you get a graph of the document, and you can, enter, you can ask in that graph what are the hub words and what are the authority words. That's exactly what we did here with the Wikipedia text about love. The authority values are yeah, to love, love is expelled and authority, love is a human thing, has something to do with God, with words we are saying, with my life, with people. So and what are the more general concepts uh, about uh, love? It's something like friendship, sure, friendship is a more general word for love, intimacy, passion, religion, attraction, that are things which are maybe more uh, general. So and that we are using, depending on if we want to refine a search, we use the authority values. And sometimes we want to know where a topic comes from. Yeah, for instance, why Obama become president? Yeah, if you give such a question, you give end of course, Obama's name, but you need some generalizing words, then you say the hub values for the search, and you see it's correspond to what we get from the differential analysis uh, on the basis of different text corpora. So that are the mechanism we, in, we, we use to refine the ethics, the torture I have introduced to you in, in the last uh, slide. And here is a tool at doganalyzer.de you can obtain that tool after my talk, and you can play with that. That tool exactly takes any search result from Google, analyze that page using that hit, adaptive hits algorithm, and on the basis of that analysis, it suggests you better search work or an extension to your search work. And I told you, doganalyzer.de, and with the address, you can go to that site can download the tool, install it. The tool is a plug-in to your web browser, to Firefox or Google Chrome, uh, and you go on uh, and try to do it. So last but not least, that work is approximately six months old, is a detection of topic changes. That means most of our approaches are working either with a term frequency analysis uh, on the local computer or with a core current analysis that I have introduced to you uh, just before. Then we realize the frequency of word use, especially in news, depends on what happened in the real world. So for instance, if a new flu epidemic comes up, uh, we will realize that the words fever, headache, muscle pain, will appear significantly more often than in usual times without the flu academy. So unfortunately, the term frequency is not the most important thing, as you can see here. So what you see in this curve is in the green curve the frequency of the word beer in 
German news documents. So what we are using for our experiments uh, is a text corpora uh, from the German news magazine, The Mirror. Uh, we have over 30,000 documents in our database. Every document has approximately 2,000 words, and that is our experimental area when we do experiments uh, which shall be repeatable uh, for the scientific community. So you see, when you just look on the term frequency of spear, nothing happened here. And now we do the following. We consider the frequency of the word spear in time intervals. So and we don't ask how often the word spear exists in that time interval, but we ask what's about the change of the frequency between the one interval and the next interval. So something like a differential analysis. And if you are doing so, then you may obtain the term volatility of the word beer. So in the term volatility of the word beer show two significant changes in the year 2002 and in the year 2005. So from that you get to know something happened at this time. So now the question comes up, what happened at this time? So then you must go in the news and try to find some correlation. Maybe also an interesting approach for people dealing with stock analysis. In the year 2002 in Germany, uh, some additional payment uh, for, for beer bottles and uh, beer cans have been introduced. So once you buy a bottle or a can of beer, you have to pay more money which you get back when you bring the respective container back to the shop. So that has caused a huge discussion in Germany whether that is sensible, whether they increase the price of beer, how high the investment must be to uh, employ the respective automator receiving uh, the beer uh, can spec. So that is the explanation for that term. In 2005, we had an extremely hot summer time with about 40 degrees. They brought a lot of breweries in Germany to the border of their capacities, uh, making, of course, in the news some discussion about beer. So that you can see, using the term frequency as well as the term volatility, we can distinguish some concepts in our news. If there is a low volatility of the terms and, a, and an equal frequency of terms or an equal level of co-occurrences, we have some stable concepts, things which are accompany us all the lifetime, uh, nothing changed. So you see, if the number of appearances is unequal, go up or go down, the volatility is high, then something significant appears in the topic, then you have found the topic and uh, you shall uh, consider in the near future more closely because uh, something interesting is going on. So, <coughs> but so far, that are only classical approaches. All what I have done was to introduce to you the idea I establish a local client uh, which can access more context information from you than Google ever can do, which know what you are interested in and try to adapt themselves to your needs. Now we already went another step. Uh, we tempered a little bit with the Apache web server. So let's have a look uh, on this picture how to bring the web server. Most of you will say a clear client server concept uh, together with the peer-to-peer -peer system. So here on the upper level we have our web pages. The web pages are connected with the links they contain. So here in the upper part of the picture you have nothing else than the usual web graph. How you obtain the usual web graph, how the usual web graph is brought to you, usually already in a decentralized manner, because of the web pages are hosted by web servers. And when you are on the one website, you can click a link, the link brought you to another web server, and you can uh, switch between the web servers without even you are realizing it. And in that consideration, we are already a little bit closer to the peer-to-peer system. 
Now we did, together with a PhD student of mine, another step. Now we said, okay, we are doing the following. Every web server get a little addition. Again, something like a plugin, but that plugin is a peer software. The peer software using the links between the web pages and build up a peer-to-peer -peer system with the same structure as a web peer. But in addition now, we allow that even peer joins which are not web servers, which don't host any web contents for us. So the structure of that peer-to-peer -peer system can be much broader, can be much more general than the structure of the web graph we had so far. So in addition, every of the Apache web server to a reward indexing locally. It means the same reverse indexing every search engine pool after the information from the web has been crawled. So now I have here peer-to-peer -peer system. What we are doing now, because of simplicity, we didn't decide to use the Freenet method, but we decided to use the Nutella mechanism. You can make a search request in the peer-to-peer -peer information and find any of the documents already as a Google search engine. Then at the part, what already is working. Now we went on. Now we came up with a question, if I have a search, and if I would have a mechanism guiding me from any node in that peer-to-peer -peer system, following my search request to the right nodes, that means have something along the edges letting a request pass if the request fit to the information which are behind that ad and block the request if I look for search words which are not behind that edge. Then I could build something like a fully decentralized search engine. So and that is that for what we have actually a lot of ideas that we expect in October in our workshop in Mallorca to uh, show the fully concept. Uh, that is something what we can discuss maybe when I come the next time to your university or some of you join us uh, for some research stay with us. So, summary and outlook. A first idea of a fully decentralized search engine is what in my department. We are currently in the phase of realizing and patenting it. Uh, the hope <coughs> is that in the future no more copying of the whole world wide web is necessary what is from our point also not possible to do because we know that the number of web pages grows in an exponential manner. And when it's going in an exponential manner, you know from your algorithm lecture that we are not able uh, to copy all in time. So that would provide us with 100% actual information, but it's also not guaranteed with Google. Think about how often you click on a link in a Google search result and Google told you that website don't exist anymore. We can offer new services, we have ideas for that. We can offer new interfaces where you can evaluate the results by dragging it left or right side and the system process your evaluation. And of course, if in case we don't have a central database anymore, but everybody contributes with his sources to the search in the internet, uh, then we have also no more chance uh, for the NSA. So the only thing what we have to care for is, of course, we still have to be as fast as Google, and here will be a little more, bit more effort to do in the future. So far, I'm at the end of my talk. I would be happy if you have some questions, comments, or if you would get some good discussions by email or and pass a note with you in the future. Thank you very much. collecting as a user behavior in the local agent. We don't 
uh, provide any user information outside the local computer except what you can derive from the content of search requests given to Google itself. When we are coming to the peer-to-peer -peer approach as I have shown in the last two slides, then we are, of course, fully decentralized. So no information of you is given away. And the picture, I am, and actually it's not to do with oh, if you know me, I'm a fan of science, uh, science fiction literature, so if you remember Star Wars, the city in the clouds, that's the picture is coming from. search results definitely are on the database. Google can tell you how much users are looking for them. So actually in the peer-to-peer -peer approach, what we are doing, uh, we still do the broadcast so you see how much, you, uh, what other users are looking for. You can do by yourself. Uh, of course, every owner of an information can establish a statistics how often a file has been accessed. Uh, but it would be quite difficult to say how much users are looking in a moment for contents. Uh, I don't know if that is what you want. So uh, the other question is, also Google provide me a ranking for the information, which can be also very useful for marketing proposals or the success of marketing at all. Uh, I got that question in another talk. Uh, the answer is, uh, page rank has a nice property. I can calculate the page rank when I know the whole web graph as a result of a matrix operation. However, and Page and Breen mentioned that in their original publication by themselves, page rank corresponds to the probability that a random walker visit a web page. So when I establish a random walker based mechanism in a distributed peer-to-peer uh, -peer community, or a usual, a usual tool today, then I'm also able to uh, support the patron information in a decentralized manner. Um, on the issue of these uh, centralized search engines like Google, um, our privacy is important, right? Because we don't want NSA to, to monitor our searches and, and our listing. Yes. But, um, okay, my first question is, if the NSA is able to monitor Google, right, uh, and you decentralize the search engine, what prevents the NSA from monitoring these other decentralized search engines? And my second question is that uh, there's actually a, a, a two-edged sword. Um, if we are doing something that is legal, uh, ethical, uh, of course we want our privacy is important, but uh, people do use the internet for illegal stuff, like for instance, uh, pedophiles, you know? You know, that is a very German question what you give me now. Is yeah, that, that is a German question. I worry about this and this. Uh, you know, let me answer you with a story. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was, was, was very big uh, news about uh, a guy from the German parliament who used uh, the frequent flyer miles he obtained from his business trips for private trips. Okay? Consequently, all over governmental services, procedures have been established to, to monitor and make sure that no German officer is using frequent flyer miles anymore for private business. So that measurements cost thousands of euros to establish to have the respective monitoring and so on. So we are assuming all these people will be bad. Why we never assume that people will be good and we have only to give penalty to the bad people? So that is the answer to your question. Because of one guy is doing something bad, and we don't use any opportunity for millions of others, that cannot be the answer. 
Uh, the answer could be, of course, also I'm a computer scientist and not a, <laughs> not a law guy. Uh, the other question about the NSA is, sure nobody can prevent the NSA to go in the network and give the network questions and obtain the answer and obtain all information. I don't want to do it because by that I would limit the liberty of any other user. But it is much more difficult to obtain the right data when you must collect it by the right keywords from resources all over the world and when you have it in a huge centralized database and must establish just any filters in that centralized database and that is your answer. <laughs>